Okay, so welcome to the second of the um, videos on criminal courts procedure and sentencing, and this one is on procedure to trial. And uh, I'm just going to remind you again, remember what I said, this is easy, these are easy marks. So please don't just pay lip service to the criminal court system, um, make sure that you use it to your advantage to obtain the best marks that you possibly can. So let's start then by looking at the procedure. How do cases get to court? And the first thing I want to talk about is this basic principle in that the procedure has to ensure that justice is carried out and that criminal cases especially must be dealt with justly. And there's a simple and straightforward reason for that is that we all as members of society have to be comfortable with the fact that if we are unfortunate enough to find ourselves in the criminal court system, that we know that no matter where we are, no matter where we are in the country, no matter who it is that we are that, that, that is responsible for deciding our guilt or innocence, is that that will be done fairly and justly. If that doesn't happen, the whole faith in the system collapses. So in order to ensure that that is maintained, we have um, legislation to demonstrate it. And the legislation is, in this instance, is the Criminal Procedure Rules 2012. Now, these come about and are updated quite frequently. I think the ones before this were 2005, so the Criminal Procedure Rules 2005. But as you can see, only last year these were updated. And the Criminal Procedure Rules are an extensive piece of legislation, and I'm only going to give you a flavour of, of some of the, um, the things that it says must happen. Um, but essentially it covers what criminal courts are for and how they should conduct themselves. So all criminal courts in the first instance of court is, are about, um, oh, I've, got, I've spelt that wrong straight away, they're about acquitting the innocent. So that just means if you're not guilty then courts should be charged with making sure that you, you are not held to account and you're allowed to go free. But at the same time, of course, that also means that they are charged with convicting the guilty because the courts, the courts have the responsibility of keeping us safe. They are to deal with the defence and the prosecution fairly. They must not be biased. You can see that's the point of this little cartoon here. They must make sure that both the prosecution and the defence are dealt with fairly and equally. They must deal with the um, the rights of the defendant and by that we mean article 6 now of the Human Rights Act so they must deal with the rights of the defendant they must respect the interests of witnesses victims and jurors they must deal with cases expeditiously and by that we mean as quickly as they possibly can if you are awaiting trial for a serious offence, the fact that that will affect the rest of your life is bad enough without that being dragged out over a great period of time. So it's expected that the um, people that are involved in bringing this to trial will do so in the quickest and most expeditious manner. They should ensure that appropriate information is available to the court when bail and sentencing are considered. So they need to make sure that they have in to hand all of the right aggravating and mitigating factors, including things like pre-convictions, including um, uh, supportive statements. So as when the sentencing is decided, it's decided completely impartially and fairly. And then they have to deal with the case in ways that take into account the seriousness of the offence alleged, the complexity. And we've talked about that when we talked about serious fraud cases about how complex they are. The severity of the consequences for the defendant and others affected. And, uh, and by that, of course, you could say that if an offence is committed by an 85 year old man uh, and you know that five years in prison could see the end of his life. So you, you would have to judge about what is the what are the consequences of this uh, offence and the sentencing that you're about to pass on the individuals that you're about to do so? And also the needs of other cases. What other cases have you got that need dealing with and which is the most important? Now, once again, I would advise you in your toolkit as lawyers to have digital copies of all of this legislation. 
to look through it to just give you some idea about what it contains. Now you can do that through the Law Bank but you can also do it through any of the official government websites, you can also do it via places like Balliol um, and the links to all of those places are on the Law Bank and I'll remind you again the website for that is www.thelawbank.co.uk Okay, so just um, visit there and download the legislation and you get a chance to look at it for yourself. So what I'm going to do now is quickly just go through the procedure for each of the summary, either way, and indictable offences. And what, what is the procedure? How do we get from um, somebody committing an offence to being to go into trial? And we're going to start with summary offences. Remember, summary offence, court of first instance is the magistrates, is it not? So, our starting point is that the defendant is charged or summoned. Generally, the charge will be done by the police and generally that will be done at police station. But they only have a right to charge for a few very minor offences. OK, so that's not the norm. What would normally happen is there will be a summons as a result of inquiries and a decision to prosecute. And that decision is normally taken by the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service. So the Crown Prosecution Service, who are the government's lawyers, the state's lawyers, they will decide whether or not there is sufficient evidence to prosecute somebody. And if they decide that there is then they will be summoned to appear at Magistrates Court. And don't bear in mind, we're dealing with minor offences here, aren't we? What happens next is that the court hears a bail or custody hearing. Should the individual, if it's the case is serious enough, should the individual be bailed or should they um, be kept in custody until the, the case of the, the, the full case hearing? Now, this is going to be pre-trial work. And if the police have charged... They do also have a right to decide whether or not to police bail out to magistrates court or whether or not to go to court the next morning to magistrates to ask that the suspect the defendant be kept in custody. The magistrates court will also, as we've heard on the previous video, will decide on who funds the representation. Who is it that's going to pay for the defence? Is the defendant going to pay for their own defence or is the state going to have to pay for them? Um, because of the severity of criminal law, everybody gets the right to be represented. Even if they can't afford them themselves, then one is appointed and by one. I mean, a, a, a defence solicitor will be appointed for them. And the final stage is whether or not they plead guilty. If this is all happening by post and a great number of cases this can be done by post if it's not and they don't plead guilty then they'll go to trial if they do plead guilty then there's no court appearance and the easiest way to talk about that is in about driving offenses for those of you unfortunate enough to be stopped speeding attached to that form will be the chance for you to plead guilty and pay your fine or for you not to plead guilty. If you plead guilty, you pay the fine and then that's it. It's all done and finished. If you don't plead guilty, then you'll send a letter back to say, then you, can you appear at the magistrate's court on this date? So that's the, that's the procedure for summary offences. Charge or the summons, then the, hear, the pre-trial hearings, bail or custody, and who's going to publicly fund, whether there's going to be public funding. And then either the chance to plead guilty or to appear in court. Either way offences, um, slightly more complex. Generally, we start with the court selection. And we know that the magistrate's court, the first hearing, is always going to be in a magistrate's court. And the magistrate's court will decide, so it's a, a, a mode of trial hearing. The magistrate's court will decide whether or not it's going to be heard in the Magistrates' Court or in the Crown Court. And at this hearing, both sets of lawyers make cases as to where they want the trial. Now, remember what I said when we looked at the previous video. Generally, it is the defendant's choice as to where they want the, um, the on an either-way offence, where they want to be heard in a Crown Court 
or in a magistrate's court. And it's the magistrate's clerk and the lawyers will explain to the defendant the choice of plea. Then if he pleads guilty, then they will proceed to sentence. So a guilty plea goes straight to sentence. And a guilty plea may go to sentence in the Crown Court if they consider that the likelihood for sentence is going to be more than six months. If he decides not to plead not guilty, then the magistrates will have to decide if their sentencing powers are enough for that offence. If their sentencing powers are enough, so let's take it's a theft of two packets of crisps from the local news agents, then the magistrates courts are likely to accept that they will hear it and it will proceed to trial. If they decide that they that, that it's a lot more than that, that somebody is over the course of has been caught stealing, I don't know, large amounts of material from B&Q, and that if found guilty, that person is likely to need more than six months imprisonment, then they might decide to send it for trial at the Crown Court because of the level of sentencing. So if their powers are not sufficient, then they send it to the Crown Court. If they can hear it at the Magistrates Court, the defendant can still elect to go to the Crown Court because the defendant has the choice. And you've got to consider that this is a really complex decision for the defendant to make. And it's complex because... The rates of acquittal on not guilty pleas are higher at the jury trial. So if you plead not guilty, you are more likely to get off at a jury trial. Lots of defendants feel that they receive a fairer trial at Crown Court. They believe that magistrates hear inadmissible evidence, that they're case hardened, they accept police evidence right regardless of its accuracy. And we looked at some of those things when we looked at um, the lay magistracy in Unit 1. Jury trials, however, have greater delays. It takes longer to get to court. There are much greater defence costs because generally you will be employing a barrister and the case will go on for longer. You, if you choose to go to Crown Court, then you will be choosing to go to a court with a greater sentence in power. So therefore, it's not an easy choice. So that choice, the defendant's choice, requires good quality legal advice. And the last thing to say is, whilst making that term choice, the defendant is entitled to something called advanced disclosure which means they're entitled to see the evidence against them. OK, so having decided, they then go to case management hearing. And case management hearing is where the date is planned, what evidence is required is planned, what witnesses will be planned. All of the, the sort of general administration of the case happens pre-trial. Then we end up in trial, and this is, of course, <clears throat> if it's going to be magistrates, ge uh, Crown Court generally, if it's the magistrates' court and the defendant, if the, the, the magistrates decide that they are going to hear this case and the defendant agrees, they will generally proceed straight to trial. The Crown Court will be sent for trial. If it's sent for trial, there will need to be a case management hearing because the, the Crown Court sits less frequently, it's busier, it listens to longer cases, so the planning has to be far more careful. And at the trial, there is then a, either a plea of guilty, and we go straight to sentencing by the judge, or a plea of not guilty, and we go to trial by jury. Okay, so that's the either way offence. Indictable offences, once again, become far more complex. As ever, they always appear before a magistrate's where you will hear bail and funding of representation hearing. But that passes quickly through the magistrates. Okay. 
so quickly and the magistrates hear these things very very quickly because that if you remember we go back to the criminal procedures rules that has to be done expeditiously it's straightforward and there are questions that are asked only on issues of bail and who will fund the defendant that's all that they're asked in, in magistrates and the defendant then gets um, a send in for trial order All right. And you've got to bear in mind this is an indictable offence only, so it is going to go to Crown Court. So the magistrates don't need to spend too long. They're going to listen to bail, they're going to listen to representation, and then they're going to send for trial. Simple, straightforward. The first hearing is a plea and case management hearing. The court will need to know if the defendant is intending to plead guilty or not guilty. If they are going to plead not guilty, then the case management hearing is going to be in far greater depth because they'll need to think about exhibits, witnesses, the length of time that the case is likely to take. If the plea is guilty, then essentially all that the judge needs to do is to make sure that he has all of the right information so that he can sentence. The judge will look at the procedures and check that the given date is workable. So what day are we looking at going to trial and is that workable dependent on what the plea is? So the judge has a managerial role at this point. So the judge has a managerial role. The sentencing, if it's going to be guilty, the sentencing can take place immediately. But it will depend on whether or not all of the information has been gathered or whether or not the judge wants more information, such as a probation report, before he decides to sentence. If the defendant pleads not guilty, then the defence and the prosecution have to inform the court of a number of things. So not guilty, if it's not guilty, the defence and the prosecution have to inform the court. Are there any issues in the case? How many witnesses will each side be bringing? Whether there have been any admissions made in the process at all. So was there an admission made at the police station which has since been withdrawn? What are the exhibits and how many of them are there? What documents will be used by the defendant during the trial? Are there any contentious points of law? Do the lawyers think that there is a part of the law that they will be challenging that are quite tricky? And that allows the judge to think about the work that they might need to do prior to court. Are there any questions about admissibility of evidence? Is one side likely to say that that piece of evidence is hearsay or that exhibit cannot be admitted for a particular reason? And how long? they think the trial is likely to last bearing in mind all of these other issues and this is all done in a questionnaire so most of these things are done in a questionnaire and submitted to the court and this is all part of the plea and case management hearing it may be used from the defense's point of view to obtain an indication of sentence and that might help the decision making process so the defence might say, "Do is this likely, from what we know so far, is this likely, if we are found guilty, is this likely to be six months in prison, 12 months in prison, 18 months in prison? And that might help them to advise their client to make a decision about whether or not to plead guilty or not to plead guilty. The judge will give decisions about the direction or he'll give directions, I should say, about the processes and the dates and will post a notice of fixture. So they'll then post a notice of fixture. And the notice of fixture is about the date. The date, then, is the day in which the trial by the jury happens at Crown Court. OK, so complex. And what you're likely to be asked in a question is... It will come after your scenario. You'll decide that somebody is liable or not for a Section 20 or a Section 18 offence or an ABH offence. And the question is likely to ask, what is the procedure for X to go to court? If it's a Section 18, you will go through the indictable offence that we've just talked about. 
if it's a section 20 or ABH, then what you will do is you'll go through this um, procedure as we've discussed earlier on. The only thing now to talk about on this video is to talk about bail. And once again, bail comes through a piece of legislation. Um, the Bail Act 1976 gives a general right of bail. So what it says is everybody is entitled to bail unless certain um, things exist. And it also says that bail can be given at a police station if you are charged at the police station. The Criminal Justice Act 2003 also allows something called street bail, which means that you can um, charge somebody pretty much on the street and you can bail them to appear back at a police station or you can bail them to appear back at the, um, at the court at a, at a later given date. But generally, court bail is given through the magistrate's court. And if that's granted, the defendant is released from custody until their court date or until they're asked to reappear at a police station. So they're given court, uh, they're given bail for court date or to reappear at a police station. Let's just explain those two. It may be that you're bailed to appear back in court to hear the case one month from now. It might be that the police have started the investigation, they don't have enough evidence as of yet, or they, and therefore they might want another month to investigate further, and they will bail you to reappear at the police station, where they will either interview you again and charge you, or they will tell you that they didn't find sufficient evidence, and then the charge will finish. Now, there are a, different, a few different types of bail. The first is, and I want to talk about, is that... Um, oh, sorry, now let me talk about refusal of bail first. Because we've looked at, the court might decide to bail, you have a right to bail, but what are the things that might mean that you are refused bail? And here's a great picture of Julian Assange. And Julian Assange is the man that was bailed very recently. Um, and has now taken refuge in, I think it's the Colombian embassy, but or the Bolivian embassy, I think, but certainly has breached his bail. But bail might be refused because they might think that the defendant might abscond, they might do a runner, might commit an offence whilst they're on bail, interfere with witnesses. So very often... Very often, gang. Uh, very often, people that that ran gangs, criminals, East End gangsters, frequently would interfere with witnesses to stop them giving evidence in in later court cases. So at that point, they would um, be refused bail to stop them interfering with the witnesses, or of course, not only witnesses but also with the criminal process. They might hide evidence. My writing is terrible today. I do apologise. So they might um, interfere with witnesses or criminals. So th those reasons would be reasons to refuse a suspect bail. But if they are given bail, then there are two different sorts. There is conditional bail and there is unconditional bail. And the police or courts may impose requirements to ensure that the trial process remains fair. And if they do that, they might decide, if they're going to bail, that they should apply certain conditions on the defendant. And those conditions should be specific and they should be justifiable. So specific and justifiable. Conditions can be surety. And by surety, we mean money. Or security, and by security we mean an asset. So it could be your home, for instance, your car. And these are forfeited if the bail is broken. And the reason that I've put, this is Jemima Khan. And Jemima Khan gave 
surety for Julian Assange's bail. And if I remember rightly, she allowed or she gave a surety, along with others, of £1 million, which if Julian Assange breached the terms of his bail, she would lose. She and others would lose the million. And of course, what happened was Julian Assange breached the terms of his bail. He sought asylum in an embassy, which meant that Jemima Khan and the other um, people who were supplying the surety lost their £1 million. It might also be the case that the defendant might have to surrender their passport as part of the bail condition. Other conditions might be things like post-release conditions. So if those are the things that have to happen before bail will be granted, you either offer a surety or security, then there might be post-release conditions. And they might be to report at a police station every day. They might be they have to live at a stated address. And this was where Julian Assange, it's a, it's a stately home in Norfolk, and Julian Assange was told that he had to live and reside at that premise. He couldn't live anywhere else. You might be told to stay away from certain people or certain places. Or you might be asked to wear a tag or a curfew. You can't wear a curfew, but you might have to be a subject of a curfew. And the court only, the court... Um, the court can only grant those tags or curfews. If conditional bail is breached, okay, if, so if breached conditions, then they are arrested, the defendant is arrested, and brought to the magistrate's court. They will lose their bail and be remanded in custody before the court case. If they then are on bail and they fail to appear at court, so they'll be bailed, so let's just say I've been bailed to appear at court one month from now. If I fail to appear in court one month from now, that is also a prosecutable offence. Okay. Alternatively, the court or the police station could grant completely unconditional bail. If the defendant is unlikely to commit further offences, so unlikely to commit further offences, they will attend court and not interfere with the justice system then they are normally released on unconditional bail. And I've got an image there of Chris Hewn, if you remember. Um, and Chris Hewn was given unconditional bail. He was a public figure. He was a member of parliament. It was unlikely um, that he was going to commit further offences, that he was going to attend court. He was too public not to. So that's slightly more complex, I have to say, as a... Um, as a video there's slightly more to that and there's slightly more information it is not difficult there is just lots to learn so please make sure that you have learned those things and um, as I say they are easy marks the last video in this series is the one that looks specifically at sentencing